Thank you very much and welcome to presentation number four in our series, Religion, What Went Wrong. I've really enjoyed my time here in Copenhagen and it's been a blessing to be with you each and every evening so far. And we've come to the end of this uh, short series and I hope it's been a blessing. And uh, I believe and pray that tonight will also be a great blessing as we travel together um, through Bible prophecy. Uh, we're going to start with a word of prayer as we have done the other evenings, and then we'll get right into our material for tonight. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thanks so much for bringing us again here. We ask that your spirit will be with us to guide us as we open your word together. We pray that your word may find a place in our hearts and that you will lead us indeed out of the confusion of religion and to the saving arms, into the saving arms of Jesus. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, um, I want to begin with uh, a conversation that I heard about some years ago between a Christian and an atheist that sat next to each other on an airplane. And um, I'm sure many of you have had maybe some interesting conversations when you're on airplanes. You can't really go anywhere. Uh, you're stuck to the person that is sitting next to you. And some interesting conversations can take place. On this occasion, uh, the Christian pulled out um, some literature that he was going to read, and it was clearly some Christian content. And uh, as they got into the conversation with the person sitting next to him, which was an atheist, the atheist said to the Christian, um, you know what, I'm, I'm, I, I don't believe in God at all. Uh, I'm an atheist. And uh, the Christian said, well, um, can you tell me about the God that you don't believe in? And uh, so um, the, Christian, the, the, the atheist started saying, started explaining about this God that deterministically decides who's going to be saved and who's going to be lost. Uh, a God that, that puts people into uh, eternal damnation, eternal hell. Um, a God that, and, and, and as he goes on describing this picture of a God that really you don't find in the scriptures, in the Bible, uh, the Christian turned to the atheist and said, well, um, if that's the case, then I'm an atheist as well, because I don't believe in that God either. Uh, and I think when we're talking about this subject of religion, what went wrong, I think what we can clearly, what we have clearly already identified in this short series is that religion has often misrepresented Jesus. And, and uh, therefore, it's understandable in many ways that there are many atheists in the world today. People have, that have distanced themselves from religion because religion has given a false picture of God. And therefore, it's so important for us to go back to the Bible and to go back to the roots of Christianity and to discover what has been lost. Because I believe that when we pull away the man-made layers of tradition, that we will find a beautiful picture of the person Jesus Christ. And that's been our attempt in the course of this short series. And I hope that it has inspired you to also for yourself get acquainted, more acquainted with the gospel story, more acquainted with the Bible and the word of God. Uh, Paul, the apostle Paul, which wrote a number of letters in the New Testament, he uh, wrote the following in 2 Corinthians 4, 4, which I, be I believe describes well uh, the condition uh, of the, um, in many ways, the, even the Christian world around us. He says, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. And we talked a little bit uh, during this series about this battle, this great controversy that is raging in the universe between good and evil. And there is an enemy in the picture here, and the enemy is attempting to blind the eyes of people so that they don't see clearly the picture of God and the picture of Jesus. And uh, I believe that oftentimes this blinding has also happened in the very name of Christianity. Sometimes we think, well, the, the you know, minds that are being, but people that are not seeing uh, the truth, that certainly must be um, all these other kinds of religions or other kinds of worldviews out there. But even the Christian religion itself has participated uh, and been uh, a, 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 way, a means of people not seeing clearly the person Jesus. And we looked a little bit about at that uh, yesterday night and also also um, on our, in our second uh, presentation uh, on Friday. Now, 
Tonight, for the last time, I want to invite you again to put on the prophetic glasses and to take a look at the world around you uh, from the perspective of Bible prophecy, from the perspective of Scripture. And what we're going to look at tonight is we're going to take a look at what I would like to call three unread messages. And uh, these three unread messages we find in the book of Revelation, they're also referred to as the three angels' messages. And these messages really tie into this topic and this theme that we've been talking about, religion, what went wrong. In the book of Revelation, uh, the, uh, the writer of the book of Revelation, John, uh, records these three messages that, that are going to go into all the world before Jesus returns, before Jesus comes back the second time. And uh, as John wrote from the island of Patmos, he is writing 2,000 years ago, but he's writing about events that will transpire from his days uh, till our time and even into the future um, until the restoration of all things. So it's very interesting as you study the book of Revelation to take notice of how the book of Revelation is there to prepare us for Christ's return. And so, again, we're going to look at some of these symbols in the book of Revelation. And as we talked about before, there are many terms that are used in the book of Revelation that are taken from the Old Testament. We will see that that is also the case tonight as we study through these three messages that are found in Revelation chapter 14. Now, in Revelation chapter 14, where you have these three messages or these three angels' messages as, as they are referred to, um, it is interesting to note that in the end, after these three messages are, are proclaimed, the very next event that you read about in Revelation chapter 14 is the coming of Jesus, the second coming of Jesus. And uh, within Christianity, we hear a lot about the first coming of Jesus. We know the Christmas story, the birth of Jesus 2,000 years ago. But you don't always hear so much about this Jesus, about Jesus and the promises he gave that he will one day come again. But a theme throughout the book of Revelation is that Jesus indeed will come back to this world. Not in the same way that he came 2,000 years ago, but this time as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And in Revelation chapter 14 and verse 14, we have the following description of the coming of Jesus. It says, then I looked and behold a white cloud and on the cloud sat one like the son of man. And that's an interesting description. We talked a little bit about that in our second presentation when we studied Daniel chapter 7. Jesus was also there um, identified and described as the son of man. So this is a description of Jesus. Jesus himself used this description more than 80 times in the New Testament gospels to refer to himself. So Jesus, the son of man, comes on a cloud and it says that he has on his head a golden crown and in his hand a sharp sickle. Now, what do you do with a sickle? With a sickle, you reap the harvest. And the symbolism that is displayed here is that when Jesus comes back, there will be a harvest to reap, a harvest of people that have chosen to belong to his kingdom and that he is now going to take to a place that he has prepared for them where we will spend eternity with him. But before this takes place, before this, this, this culmination of, 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 of history um, takes place, before Jesus comes back the second time, there are these three messages that will go into all the world. And they are mentioned here in Revelation chapter 14. Now, the way they are portrayed in Revelation 14 uh, is through three angels that gives these three messages. Uh, now, we don't expect that there's going to be a literal angel flying in the air and giving this message, but this is really a symbol of a message that is going to go to all people. As a matter of fact, an angel throughout Scripture, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, is a picture of a messenger. It's a messenger that comes with a message from God to human beings. And this is the case here also. Here we have three messages that, 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 that um, are going to be proclaimed uh, by people, to people, uh, in preparation for this great return of the King of Kings, Jesus Christ. And the first message of the three, uh, we can read in Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 and 7. And take notice, what we're going to do tonight is we're going to basically just walk through these three messages and see how they link into this overall theme of religion, what went wrong. Uh, and the first message... Um, we can read it here in Revelation 14, verses 6 and 7. It says, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, 
having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, fear God, give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. It's a beautiful message. A powerful message, a compelling message. The message is that the gospel of Jesus Christ is going to go to all the world. Not just to some people, not to just to some country, not just to some places. No, everyone is to hear the good news. The word gospel actually means good news. And, and what is the good news about? The good news is about Jesus that came into this world, that took our sins upon himself, that died the death that we deserve in order to give the life, the eternal life, uh, as a gift to each and every one of us. So the everlasting gospel will be preached in all the world. And um, this gospel involves a call to worship him who made the heavens and the earth, to worship the creator. And so we find in the very at the very foundation of this final message is the beautiful good news of the gospel. Now, when Jesus told his disciples back in the gospels, what would be some of the signs that would transpire before he would come again? Notice this, that he told them in Matthew 24, verse 14, that this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations and then the end will come. And so when we're talking about, you know, prophetic events and uh, last day events and things that are going to happen in this world before Jesus comes back, one of the most encouraging signs and most important signs is this, that the gospel will be preached as a witness to all people, to all nations. Now, the message of the first angel calls us to fear God and give him glory. Now, that doesn't mean to be afraid of God. Actually, the word fear here is, a, is, is, is talking about reverence, talking about, about giving honor to God, not being afraid of God. Uh, we find throughout scripture that God is not a God to be afraid of. He wants to be a friend. He is close. Um, he has revealed himself as a good heavenly father. Um, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 20, it talks about how we can glorify God. It says, for you were bought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God. So when the first angel says, fear God and give him glory, it's a call to honor God in the way that we treat our bodies. Our bodies are like the temple of the Holy Spirit. There's another text in the Bible that's, that tells us this. Jesus has created us. And he has saved us. And I like to say it this way, that we actually belong to Jesus. We belong to God twice, but both because he has created us, but also because he has redeemed us. He has saved us from sin. And this call to worship him because he has created heaven and earth really ties into something that we talked about yesterday. In our presentation yesterday, we revisited the Ten Commandments. So we looked at the Ten Commandments as ten promises. And you'll remember that the Ten Commandments are progressive and they reveal the relationship that God wants with each and every one of us. And one of the commandments that we looked at yesterday was the fourth commandment, dealing with this special gift of time that God wants to spend time with you and with me. We find this in the fourth commandment, which we can read about in Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 to 11, which says, for in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. And you can see that even the, the, the language that is used in the commandment is very similar to the language that is used in the first angel's message. It's a call to worship God. And how do we worship him? By remembering that he is our creator. Uh, I shared this quote with you yesterday as well. Um, man could not keep the original Sabbath and forget God. It's like a weekly reminder of God as our creator. A reminder of both creation and salvation. 
Now, we're going to move now to the second angel, and the title of our presentation tonight is Coming Out of Confusion. And it's very interesting how the three angels are, these three messages are built up. The first message is really re re revealing the light of the gospel, the everlasting gospel, the call to worship God, the call to identify ourselves with Jesus Christ who has redeemed us and saved us. As we come to the second angel's message, the second message that is to go into all the world before Christ comes, it is really revealing some of the confusion within religion. And take notice, it's just one verse, actually. It's verse 8 in Revelation chapter 14. And again, it's a little bit of a symbolic uh, typological language here. But we're going to dive a little bit deeper and see what this actually means. But the text says the following. And another angel followed. So after the first angel, after the first message, comes now the second message. And this is the message. Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. So uh, on first glance, you might think, what is this talking about? What is Babylon? What is the city? What is, what is the wine? What is the wrath of her fornication? Now, in order to understand the book of Revelation, I think I mentioned this on the first night, and I maybe even mentioned it several times during this series. In order to understand the book of Revelation, we have to go back into the Old Testament. As a matter of fact, um, the Bible is made up of 66 books, but it's really a unified story. And a lot of the terminology and names and typology and symbols of the Old Testament, they come back in the end in the book of Revelation. And so to understand what Babylon is, well, we can go back into the Old Testament story and we can actually find identification marks of Babylon that help us to understand what this means in an end time setting, in a prophetic setting. So uh, let's do that. We push the rewind button, and we're going to go back in time. We're going to go back all the way to an ancient story that you can read about in the first book of the Bible, in the book of Genesis, which talks about this great project of building a tower, the Tower of Babel. Maybe you've heard the phrase or the story. You've heard about this. But way back in, way back in the day, way back in ancient history, there was a story about a people that came together, many people that came together, and they had a project, and they wanted to build a huge tower that in their minds, they described it as they wanted to, to reach all the way to the heavens. Now, this story appears in the Bible right after the flood story. So there's only just really a couple of events that transpire in the first chapters of uh, the Bible. You have the creation story in Genesis chapter 1. You have the story about how mankind fell into sin in chapter 3. And, and then you have this, 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 um, this amazing story about the flood and Noah. Uh, and then after that comes this story about um, the Tower of Babel. Now, after the flood, when Noah and his family um, were to repopulate the earth, God said to them that they were to, to spread across the face of the earth. Uh, instead, there were people, um, as, as, as time went on and, and the population of earth was growing, they thought, you know, there might, there might happen something again. There might come some cataclysmic event of a flood again. Why don't we get together, build this huge city, build this grand tower all the way from earth to heaven, and we can protect ourselves, and we can live just the way we want to live. We don't have to be afraid of this judgment of God or anything. We can just, we can just live however we want to live, and this project began, the project of Babel, which is basically a story that you can trace throughout scripture, but it started here. Now, the founder of the city of, ba of Babylon or Babel at that time was a man by the name of Nimrod. And you can actually read about him in the 10th chapter of Genesis. Now, it's interesting that oftentimes there's, a, there's significance with the names in the Bible. And the name Nimrod means we will rebel. <laughs> That's the meaning of the name. So, don't call your son Nimrod, okay? So, but Nimrod, uh, he started this great city and he got all these people together and he says, we're going to build this tower which reaches all the way to heaven so that we can live however we want to live and nothing is going to happen to us. Well, uh, take notice um, 
But out of this city, uh, it is described as a place of rebellion, unbelief, and self-exaltation. And take notice of the text here in Genesis chapter 11 that describes this, this man-made project, which is really a man-made religion when you look closer at what is happening here. Uh, it describes it in the following way in Genesis. Now, the whole earth had one language. You didn't have the division of languages yet at that time. And one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and they dwelt there. Then they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and they had asphalt for mortar. And they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. Now, there's a couple of things that I want you to notice here, which are very interesting and tie directly to our topic uh, of this series, Religion, What Went Wrong. Because if we want to want, know what went wrong in religion, we need to go back to, to, to basically identify the beginnings of false religion. And I think many of the beginnings of false religion you can already find right here at the Tower of Babel, back in the story of Genesis. Because what's taking place here. There is an ambition, but it's not an ambition to glorify God. It's not an ambition to lift up the name of Jesus or the name of God uh, or the truth as it is revealed by God through prophets. No, there is an ambition here to lift up their own name. There's a self-exaltation that is taking place. Now, take also notice of the fact that they want to go to heaven here. They want to reach the heavens, so to speak. But they don't want to reach the heavens through the means that God provides. They want to build their own way to heaven. And basically, I think we talked about this um, on the second night. I shared with you a quotation from this amazing book, The Great Controversy, where there was this Protestant named Oliverton. And he said, there are really only two types of religions in the world today. You remember that quote? One type of religion is man with all its ceremonies and all its works. And the other type of religion is the true biblical religion of what Christ has done for us. Right? And so uh, we can classify false religion as devising our own means, whether it's ceremonies or prayers or traditions or culture or whatever it is, to by our own means getting to that destination of heaven. While the Bible really reveals through the prophets, through all these different prophets, both in the Old and the New Testament, reveals there's nothing that we can do. We are weak and frail and sinful, but, but praise God, God has sent his son to save us. And by our faith in Jesus, he becomes the ladder that reaches all the way from this earth because he came, became a human being all the way to heaven. It is through Christ that we can come to heaven, that we can be reconnected to God. It's a beautiful picture when you think about Jesus as the ladder that connects earth to heaven. Uh, as a matter of fact, there was uh, one of the patriarchs by the name of Jacob. Um, he had a dream, and you can read about this in Genesis chapter 28, where he dreamt about this ladder with these angels on it, all the way from earth to heaven. And later, Jesus identified himself as that ladder, uh, as that ladder and that connection between heaven and earth. So, very interesting to think about. False religion wants to build its own ladder, wants to build its own tower. Well, things didn't really go very well, because in the story we learn that at the Tower of Babel, the languages were confused. And uh, take notice of the text here in verse 9. Therefore, its name is called Babel. Because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. So they couldn't complete their project because they could no longer communicate with each other. And so they're speaking all these different languages, and so they were scattered across the face of the earth. Now there's so much like theological depth in this story, because this story is bringing out that, 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 that uh, man-made religion will result in confusion. It will result in confusion. The name Babel comes from, it comes from babbling. Like, like there's, no, there's no clear communication that is taking place here. In the true Christian religion that is based on the person Jesus Christ, there's a clear communication of truth from God through his word to us. It's not confusion. As a matter of fact, we are called out of confusion as we're going to discover through these messages. Now, 
as you, can, as you trace the story of Babel, it's very interesting because it started there with Nimrod, we shall rebel. It started with the Tower of Babel and then they were scattered. They couldn't continue this project. But as you read through the Old Testament, you'll find different instances that, um, that, 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 that describe the story of Babylon, the story of false religion. Now, a um, very, uh, very significant place where you can read about this story is actually in the prophetic book of Daniel in the Old Testament. We've talked about these two twin prophetic books, one in the Old Testament, the book of Daniel, one in the New Testament, the book of Revelation. And in the Old Testament book of Daniel, you read about the historic setting of Babylon because Daniel himself, as a prophet, living between 500 and 600 years before Christ, found himself in Babylon because he was one of the captives of Babylon. Babylon invaded and destroyed Jerusalem and he was taken captive. And it was in Babylon that he wrote his book, the book of Daniel that we now have in the Old Testament. Now, what you learn about Babylon from that story is that Babylon, of course, had a uh, had a religion, there's no doubt about that. They, they worshiped their ancestors and they had a multiple, multiplicity of gods and such. But not only did they worship the way they thought they should worship, there was a big problem and that is that they forced their worship on others. And there's a, there's a very fascinating story and we're not going to read it tonight or re, uh, I'm just going to recapture it kind of. And if you want to, if you're, if you're interested, you can go back and read it. It's in the third chapter of the book of Daniel. But in Daniel chapter 3, there's this incredible story how King Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, builds this huge statue of gold. And then he calls all his important men to come. And among uh, those that are on the scene, there are three friends of Daniel that you also read about in the beginning of the story of Daniel. And th these three Hebrews are right there on the plains of Dura where he has set up this golden image. And then he requires everyone to bow down and worship that image. And the story tells us that these three Hebrews refuse to bow down and then they are thrown into this fiery furnace, but they don't burn. The only thing that burns are the, are the ropes that tie them. And, and, and then suddenly there's a fourth individual that appears with them in the fire, none other than Jesus Christ himself. Fascinating story. You can go back and read it in Daniel chapter 3. But the point here is that Babylon is characterized by confusion, the Tower of Babel, self-exaltation, the Tower of Babel. Uh, but it's also characterized by forced worship. Like Babylon says, this is the way you should worship. And remember we talked about on the second night, and we also went a little bit into this on our first evening together, our first presentation. The worst combination, I think I've said this several times now, the worst combination is what? Church and state. Uh, and, and, and here we already see it play out even before there was a church. Here in false religion, Babylon was a political power and a religious power at the same time. Later in church history, what took place is when the Church of Rome, the papacy, clasped hands with the kings of Europe. Ah, it was a tragic time. It was a tragic time of great persecution. Why? Because of forced worship. You can see it throughout the story of scripture. Now, in Isaiah chapter 14... You can actually read about the fall of Babylon and how it came to its end. Also in the book of Daniel, chapter 5, also describes the fall of Babylon as well. What is very interesting is that in the same uh, chapter in Isaiah, right after Isaiah the prophet, which by the way lived um, prior to Daniel. So Isaiah, you can more, uh, it's more like 700 BC we're talking about here. And when he described the fall of Babylon, right after that, he also described the fall of another being called Lucifer. Now, here uh, Isaiah takes a step back and he's actually revealing the origin of all false religion. <laughs> And the origin of all false religion is, has to do with this being that exalted himself against God in the very beginning. Uh, Lucifer was an exalted angel which rebelled against God and made war against God. The book of Revelation talks about this as well. And he fell from that position, but he took with him a third of the angels. And this was really the beginning of, of, of sin, the origin of sin. This could be a whole topic for itself, but we don't have time to go into that tonight. But it is interesting that Isaiah and other prophets in the Bible describe Babylon synonymously with, with the fall of this being. In other words, the fall of this angelic being is really behind the false religion of Babylon. And as we get to the New Testament, as we get into church history, we can also see that these same powers are behind 
false religion within Christianity. I'll just read a couple of verses here from Isaiah chapter 14 that describe the fall of Lucifer. And take notice of the language here. And maybe you can recognize some of these characteristics with what we learned about the Tower of Babel. There was rebellion, there was self-exaltation, and there was confusion. Now take notice of the description of this angelic being as he rebels against God. Isaiah 14, it says, How are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. For you have said in your heart, and here we get a little bit of an insight into what is going on in the mind and heart of Lucifer, this angelic being that rebelled against God in the beginning. It says, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mountain on the, of, of the congregation on the further sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol to the lowest depths of the pit. What is the problem with Lucifer? It's that he is exalting himself. He is a created being, but he wants to be higher than the creator. I mean, he has a problem, and this problem is with pride, with self-exaltation. Now, it's interesting that that is also the same problem with false religion. Whether you find it in the Old Testament times of Babylon, or you find it in church history, self-exaltation, power over others. I, I, I shared with you another quote on the second evening by John Acton. Uh, power tends to corrupt, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Right? And that is the church. So that's, the, that's the story of false religion. It's the story of a church that has been going through this deformation, as we've been talking about. Now, um, and this, this, is, this is encapsulated in this great controversy story between good and evil. Now, I want to bring another text out here because throughout this series, what I'm attempt attempting to do is not just to curse the darkness, but also to light a candle. And I think it's very important for us not to just look at what everything has gone wrong, but also to be able to lift up what we should be looking at and what we should be focusing on. Because yes, it is important to understand the confusion of Babylon and the confusion of false religion, but we also need to see what are we being called to? How can we get back to the person of Jesus? And I love this text in the book of Philippians, chapter 2 and verse 5 to 11. This is written by the Apostle Paul. And it's a text that really um, uh, is, is, is interesting when you compare it with what we just read in Isaiah 14. Because in Isaiah 14, what does it talk about? Lucifer. I want to go up, 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 up. I want to be like the Most High. In contrast, what, is, what does Jesus do? What did he do for us when he came to this world? Well, Paul describes it here in this text. Take notice. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So now we're going to get an insight into the mind of Christ. We just had an insight into the mind of Lucifer in Isaiah 14. Now we're going to get an insight into the mind of Jesus. And take notice of the comparison and contrast between these two. It says... Who being in the form of God, in other words, he was like God, he was equal with God, but he did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. He didn't need to rob the equality with God because he had it. He was one with God. But then it says, but he made himself of no reputation. Taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, of those in heaven and those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. It's very interesting, these two passages. Lucifer wants to go up, 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 up. He wants to be like God, but then prophecy predicts that one day he's going to fall. <laughs> He's going to go down. Whereas Christ, he was equal with God, but he came down to serve. He became a human being, not just any human being. He became a bondservant. He died a death, not just any death. He died an ignominious death on the cross in order, for, to, in order to save us. And, and the result of what he did is that he will be exalted in the end. This is really the, the great controversy in a nutshell, these two, two passages. And also a description of true religion versus false religion. False religion, self-exaltation, human praise and worship. 
forced worship, confusion, whereas Christ, self-sacrifice, love, the giving of yourself, which is exemplified uh, in the life of Jesus and what he did for us. Now, we have been looking at some passages throughout this series, and especially on our second night when we looked at the topic, a power play, uh, kings, popes, and presidents, we looked at the passage in Daniel chapter 7, uh, which brings us to the arrival of this antichrist power that is described by this little horn that came up out of the fourth beast. Do you remember that? And this little horn was a representation of the Roman church. And Rome really has two phases. You have pagan Rome under the Caesars. And then you have papal Rome under the bishops and the popes. And it was during this papal phase that is described by this little horn that a lot of confusion was brought into the Christian church. A lot of paganism was now brought into the Christian church. Now, this power in Daniel chapter 7 is that further elaborated upon in Revelation chapter 13. And if you weren't here for the second night, uh, then you can go back once the videos are up there on YouTube and you can watch it because we basically go over these prophecies. But in Revelation chapter 13, you have this beast power, which is also a picture of um, the, the, the papal church, the, the papacy. And uh, it is really a, a further um, explanation of what this power is going to do, uh, both historically, but also uh, in prophecy in the future. Now, in Revelation chapter 17, and here I'm kind of introducing now a new uh, prophecy uh, in Revelation chapter 17 uh, is again another um, symbolic picture of this same power. And the Bible, Bible prophecy is really built up in a marvelous way. And, and, and any, anyone that has been into teaching will know how important it is to uh, repeat things and then elaborate upon them. So, you know, this is just a principle that in education, you, you teach something and then you teach it again the same, but then you put a little bit more. Repeat an enlargement. And this is exactly what Bible prophecy does. It gives us a prophecy in the book of Daniel, gives us another prophecy that goes over the similar kingdoms, but then gives us more information. And then we get to Revelation, and then it recaps a little bit of what we've gone through, and then it gives more. And when you get to Revelation chapter 17, uh, you find this picture of um, a woman that is riding upon a beast, uh, and she has a name written in her forehead, and the name written in her forehead is Babylon the Great. Babylon the Great. Now, that should make us think immediately about this whole story of Babylon in Scripture. Uh, the story of Babylon in Scripture, well, Babylon that started already at the Tower of Babel. And there's this whole history of Babylon. So that when you get to the book of Revelation and you see a woman with the name Babylon, it is a picture of a, a, a counterfeit or false church. Now, the interesting thing is that in Scripture, the true bride of Christ is also, or the people of God, are resembled by the true bride of Christ. And Christ is the bridegroom. It's this amazing picture. And so the, 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 this false organiz, organized church or this false movement is represented by uh, this harlot woman that is described in Revelation chapter 17 um, that is persecuting God's people and has this name of Babylon the Great on her forehead. And um, it also calls this, 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 this Babylon, Babylon power or this, this woman that has the name Babylon, it calls it also the, the mother of harlots. That's the expression that is used in Revelation chapter 17, which is very interesting because um, the papal church also calls itself the mother church. Now, this is not something new that I'm bringing on the table here. As a matter of fact, there are many reformers that have identified Revelation 17 and Revelation 13 and Daniel 7 as the papal power and have sought to, 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 to uh, call people out of the confusion of traditions and man-made religion that came in during the Dark Ages. But back to Revelation chapter 14, verse 8, the second angel's message, we can now read it again, and, and, and now we have a little bit of the backstory uh, of Babylon in our minds as we look at this message again. It says, and another angel followed saying, Babylon has fallen, has fallen. And if we just pause there for a moment, that's good news that it's fallen. It's, it's, it's not something, it's not something that's going to last. It's not something that, that is worth uh, investing in, so to speak. Uh, it's something that has fallen. It's something that is going to pass away. It's fallen, it's fallen. That great city 
because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The wine is a symbol of, of, of her doctrines, her teachings. So, so, so this, this organization um, has, has, has propagated, has taught, has, has, has proclaimed a, a message, a teaching that is causing people to get confused. What happens when you, you know, when you drink too much? Well, you get confused. You can't think clearly. And this is the, this is the wording that the, that the revelation, the book of Revelation is using. Through doctrines, through false doctrines, we can be confused regarding the character of God. We can lose sight of the person of Jesus. And, um, you know, it's so fascinating to note that when you go back to the ancient story of Tower of Babel, right after chapter 11 that describes the Tower of Babel, in the very next chapter, Genesis chapter 12, we read about the person Abraham and how he was called out of that region of Babylon. And so you have the confused, confused uh, picture of Babylon and then the calling out of Abram. And Abram was, of course, this patriarch that is, is really, um, uh, through his lineage, eventually came the Messiah. And God used him in mighty ways to be a witness uh, at his time. And his, out of Abram, of course, of course came the, the Hebrew people. And, uh, and from the Hebrew people, we have the New Testament story that was birthed out of Judaism. We have the Christian movement and the apostles. So here is a people that God is calling out of confusion in order for them to shine a light regarding who God really is. And in Genesis chapter 12, right after the story of the Tower of Babel, we read the following. This is God speaking to Abram. Now the Lord had said to Abram, get out of your country from your father and from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. In you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And the comparison is so interesting because it says, I will bless you and make your name great. In the Tower of Babel, they wanted to make their own name great. But here it is God that makes the name of Abram great. Why? Because Abram is going to showcase the love of God to the world. That was God's plan. So this is God's plan for us today as well. God is calling his people. He's calling everyone that is willing to come out of modern Babylon. The confusion that exists today within religion. In Revelation chapter 18, verses 1 to 4, we actually read about this call to come out of modern Babylon. So this end time Babylon. We read the following. After these things, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illuminated with his glory. And he cried mightily with a loud voice saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen. That sounds very sim similar to the second angel's message in Revelation chapter 14. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins and lest you receive of her plagues. And I love how it says, come out of her, my people. That means that God has its people even in confused religion. Wherever God has his people in all denominations, in all different places, and even in places where there's a lot of religious confusion, God has his people. And what is he doing? He's saying, come out. Come out, come out, come out of the confusion into the glorious light of the gospel. When it said there in the beginning of that text, the earth was illuminated with his glory. It's really illuminated with the character of God. And God is calling us out of confusion and into an understanding of God's love and his character. We are called out of confusion regarding God's character. Now, what are some of these unbiblical teachings that we are called out of? We've, we've touched on some of these during this seminar. Uh, we talked a little bit about this idea that salvation comes only through the church. Well, we know that biblic biblically that's not true. Uh, there's no organization that can claim that only through them salvation comes. Salvation comes through Jesus Christ. That's the only way that we can be saved. It is a gift from Christ himself. Of course, we have this with confession to the priest instead of Christ. I mean, we are never in the Bible called to confess our sins to another human being. We are to confess to, of course, if we've wronged someone, we can confess our sins. But, but the only one that can forgive our sins is Jesus Christ. We can go directly to him. Uh, prayers to diseased saints, false teachings on purgatory, the immortality of the soul. We talked a little bit yesterday about Sunday worship. These are things that have come in during the deformation period, during the dark ages. Now, I put this, these sentences together to kind of 
cap, uh, to kind of capture what we're talking about here tonight. Um, the papacy is actually a materialization of the fallen human nature, seeking to take the place of God and justifying itself rather than resting in the righteousness of God. It seeks to force others instead of giving them the freedom to use their conscience. If you think about it, uh, the, the papal organization in history is really only a showcase of fallen human nature. Because fallen human nature tends to do what? To take the place of God and justify itself. You know, I, I like what Martin Luther said. He wrote the following, or he said the following, I am more afraid of my own heart than of the Pope and all his cardinals. I have within me the great Pope self. So, yes, important to identify an organization that also prophecy identifies as having distorted the character of God, but also very important to identify that really the, 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 these teachings of Rome are only an outworking of the fallen human being, the sinful self. And, and, and Martin Luther, he, he nails it. When he says that the great Pope is really within me, I have to be careful that this self-exalting spirit that is characterized in Babylon and that originated with Lucifer and that is seen in the papacy is not something that I allow to live within me. I rather, as Paul put it, I want to be crucified to self, he says, which is a symbol of death to the old man so that Christ can live within me, a new life. And uh, this is really the heart of the gospel. Well, we move on now to the third angel's message. We've come, I'm just trying to like kind of give you a big picture tonight. We looked at the first angel, the call for the everlasting gospel, the call to fear God and give him glory and worship him that created. We looked at the second angel's message dealing with the fall of Babylon and the confused religion that we are called out of. And we're going to wrap up tonight and we're going to wrap up this series by looking now at the third angel's message in Revelation chapter 14. And take notice as we read here from verse 9. It says, Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image, and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God, and the faith of Jesus. And if we could just simply say what this message is about, it's really a distinction between those that follow false religion, man-made religion, and those that follow Christ, the person Jesus, and his teachings and his life. Those that receive the mark of the beast and those that receive the, the seal of God and keep his commandments and have the faith of Jesus. This is, again, back to what we were talking about earlier, that... When, all comes, when, when it all comes down, it, you really have these two religions, those that are based on your own good works and your own ceremonies and your own prestige and your own glory and your, your, your works, or that you accept the gift of Jesus and that he works in you, his commandments, as we talked about yesterday. It's a work of Christ in us. Well, we, uh, we do see that in prophecy, um, that prophecy predicts that history will repeat itself. And uh, as we look back in history, the great problem of the Dark Ages was church and state that united together. Um, a church that then has military power to oppress those that don't follow its doctrines and dogmas. This was the problem of the Middle Ages, the problem of the church during the Dark Ages. It was when it started when Constantine, uh, when he transferred his capital from Rome to Constantinople and he gave power to the Pope in Rome and Rome started ruling over the kings of Europe and a lot of persecution resulted from that union between church and state. When you look at the life of Jesus and the teachings of Jesus, Jesus was very clear that the gospel is an invitation. It's an invitation. There's no force. We have, we have been created with a free will, and we have uh, a conscience, and we can decide, we can choose. Whenever religion starts forcing things on others, well, that's, th that's, that's when things go wrong. Now, prophecy predicts that, that this will happen again before Jesus comes back. And we looked at this prophecy a little bit on our second night uh, of this series, the second presentation. 
And uh, we looked at how in Bible prophecy you have this prediction of the first beast in Revelation chapter 13 that unites with the second beast in Revelation 13. And uh, I don't have time to recap all of that, so if you missed out on that presentation, you can, you can, you can watch it on YouTube when it comes up. But it deals with this study of, of, of this first beast representing Rome, papal Rome, and then this second beast coming up representing the United States of America, and this combination of church and state. Now, originally, the United States was a nation where church and state were separated. They were not to be, as, as a matter of fact, when you look at the Bill of Rights and the First Amendment, it talks about religious liberty. But things will change according to Bible prophecy, and once again, we will experience something of the past. Now, look at this um, contrast between the seal of God and the mark of the beast, because if we're going to answer the question, what is the mark of the beast, we need to first know what the seal of God is. Because the mark of the beast is really only a counterfeit to what God is going to do. And the Bible talks about this seal that God wants to give to his people. Isaiah chapter 8, verse 16, bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples. Uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 16, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds I will write them. We talked about the beautiful uh, promises that God has given in his commandments. There are really ten promises. The ten commandments are ten promises. And God wants to write them in our hearts. That is the way that he seals his people. Uh, Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 20. Hallow my Sabbaths, and they will be a sign between me and you, that you may know that I am the Lord your God. God wants to identify his people. It's not going to be a literal mark or seal. Many people talk about the mark of the beast as some chip or some barcode or some tattoo. Uh, no, we know that the book of Revelation deals with symbolic figurative language. And it's dealing here in essence about who you worship, who you are loyal to, who you belong to. And God says, I have those that belong to me and they are marked out by those that follow my commandments. Those that do as Jesus spoke, and they have had the commandments, they have his spirit in them, they have his promises written in their hearts and in their minds, including the fourth commandment of the Sabbath. The law of God is in the heart and the mind. So, in Revelation chapter 7, it describes this final sealing of God's people before Jesus returns. Take notice of the text here. Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, do not harm the earth and sea or the trees till we have sealed the servants of our gods on their foreheads. And the context of Revelation 7 is, again, the second coming of Christ. So before Christ comes back, God is going to say, ha, he's mine, she's mine, she's mine, he's mine. They belong to me. They, they are my servants. They, they walk in my commandments. They have the love of God written in their hearts. Right? Now, what is then the mark of the beast? The mark of the beast is really the, the contrast to the seal of God. And in Daniel chapter 7, verse 25, it talks about this little horn power, this antichrist power. And it says, he shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to do what? To change times and law. We talked a little bit about that also in our, in our presentation yesterday. And um, there, this, is no, um, this is nothing hidden that the Roman church itself claims to be able to change times and law. The Pope has power to change times, to abrogate laws, and to dispense with all things, even the precepts of Christ. And here another quote from Roman sources. I think I shared this one with you yesterday as well. The Bishop of Rome is of so great authority and power that he can modify, explain, or interpret even divine laws. The Bishop of Rome can modify divine law since his power is not of man but of God and he acts as vice regent representative of God upon earth. So they claim to be able to make this change. And um, in Catholic record, it says, Sunday is our mark of authority. The church is above the Bible, and this transference, transference of Sabbath observance is proof of that fact. So if you think about the seal of God as the law of God, you can think about the mark of the beast as the law of the beast, the law of this Roman papal power, involving also this change of Sabbath to Sunday. And so when we talk about the mark of the beast as to when this will be enforced, we can say it this way. The final mark of the beast test will come upon the world when Sunday sacredness is enforced through legislation in the USA and around the world. It will start in America 
but it says in Revelation chapter 13, eventually the whole world will follow this first beast. Now, this is something that has not yet happened. This is something that is still in the future. But the mark of the beast test is when the, the, the beast, this, this power of Rome, enforces its dogmas and forces people to worship. Now, this is the very same thing that happened in the past with Babylon. Babylon forced its worship. It's happened throughout the Dark Ages, and it's going to happen one time more, one time again, prior to the Christ, Christ's second coming. But the good news is that just like God protected his people in the past, so he will protect his people in these final events as well. And I believe that we can have hope for the future and that we can rest assured in these words in Revelation chapter 14, verse 12, where it says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. You can be among that group that God's promises can be written in your heart 